All right, so. Um, when you see something like this, first of all, what, what do we call this guy? A gentleman. No. Although it plays the same role, but this is a great right, name. Yeah. I always got Gilman's, with, Gilman's with what? Copper uh, lithium. Copper lithium. Copper lithium. Awesome. Um, yeah, and so we can just, and actually, if we're going to do a Gilman, right, there's actually two, only one of which actually gets used. But when you see these types of organ, oh, sorry, so this is a gill. When you see these types of organolithium, organometallic, whatever compounds, what do you, what do you sort of think? Nucleophile. Nucleophile. Nucleophile, exactly. That's the only thing I want you to see as soon as you see something like CH3MGBR is nucleophile. All right, so the whole idea is that this pair of electrons right here is nucleophilic. Remember, these organometallics are great at creating carbon-carbon bonds. Um, so let's just review a little bit about what we see these guys reacting with. Um, All right, everybody take a second and see if you can't figure, fill in these reaction schemes. Let me shut this window. And I lost my pen. Oh, okay. Um, and actually, these all might be a little tricky. Well, hopefully not, but let's put in the one most straightforward one, or the one that I hope everybody remembers. Give you guys another minute and a half to fill these in if you can.
All right, so for this first one, how do we make a secondary alcohol? Well, the Grignard could uh, react with, well, it could react with an aldehyde and then under acidic conditions. Yeah, not acidic conditions, be careful. So the other uh, reactant here would be um, simple aldehyde. Ethanol, right? And just so we make sure that we understand where all of our carbons are, these two could correspond to that one. And this Grignard is now this, right? So if we're gonna be good and do our reaction scheme, our reaction mechanism rather, we have the nucleophile, which is that organometallic bond coming and attacking me. Electrophilic carbonyl carbon. And then that'll bounce that pair of electrons up. This gives us the world renowned tetrahedral. tetrahedral intermediate. And then we always ask ourselves when we get to that tetrahedral intermediate, is there a good leaving group? In the case of an aldehyde, there isn't. So the only thing we can do is protonate. All right. Um, okay, so real quick, Eric. The, Eric brings up a, a good point that I wanna hammer home here. We can't do this under acidic conditions. What happens if I take H3, M, G, B, R, and I have any source of protein, uh, protein, any source of proton. So let's take, for example, a carboxylic acid. It's gonna take that hydrogen and replace the, the Grignard group. Yeah, absolutely, right? So if you have any sort of a donatable proton, whether that's even as simple as an alcohol group, it's going to be lost to the Grignard, right? So instead, this proton here will become CH3, well, that's a weird way to draw it, but whew. what I'm really gonna get is now my Grignard, my MGBR has been lost and replaced with that acidic proton. Right, so Grignards, remember, were one of those things when we did it in lab, we went through great pains to make sure that our glassware was completely dry, that there was no water around. Because if there was water, all that was gonna do is react with our Grignard, right? So it's actually, you can't have these under any sort of acidic conditions. So good to review there. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna make this smaller just because it's all in the way. And then I guess we're gonna finish off All right, how do we make a primary alcohol with our Grignards? Uh, an alkyl halide? No, it can't be an alkyl halide. Alkyl halide, you can make like an alkane from. So we'll do that in this example here. There was something kind of special that we used. Oh, all right, so how we do this, Remember, these are these epoxides we saw played kind of like a big role in this organometallics chapter. Notice that the epoxides, they don't have any sort of donatable protons, so we're good there because our oxygen has two bonds, but those epoxides being in that little triangular ring have a ton of ring strain. So it really wants to break open if possible. So in this reaction, we would have this guy coming attacking one of those carbons that would then give up that bond with oxygen and that's how we'd end up getting our epoxide. So again, if I'm just gonna follow where carbons went, the furthest one away would be that guy. And those are the epoxide carbons. All right, now what's gonna happen when we take an organometallic N Mix it with an alkyl halide. When you see alkyl halide, what comes to mind? Substitution. Substitution, yeah. And in particular, what I want you guys to sort of like have hammered in your brain. Electrophile, right? That carbon on the 
alkyl halide bond, kind of the exact opposite of what we think about when we look at a organometallic and we immediately think nucleo uh, nucleophile. If when I see an alkyl halide nine times out of 10, that carbon is playing the role of an electrophile. All right, so what's gonna happen here again? Our organometallics playing the role of a nucleophile. Tick that off. So this is a great way of creating an alkane. Again, just uh, anytime you have organometallics, they're making new carbon-carbon bonds. And then, because this is we're growing carbon-carbon bonds, it's really easy to lose count or to lose track of what's what. Let me make sure I got the correct number of carbons. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then that makes this my new carbon carbon bond. Okay. Um, all right. So now let's take this next one. We have a Grignard. And what the heck do we call these types of things right here? Acyls. Acyl, yeah. So this is an acyl halide or more specifically an acyl chloride, but yeah, acyl, uh, acyl halide. Okay. Um, well, what's, uh, what's my product going to be? It's the tertiary alcohol. The tertiary alcohol. Awesome. All right. So let's make sure we know that. So first of all, we have boom, of course, organometallic always playing the role of a nucleophile electrophilic carbonyl carbon this creates the tetrahedral tetrahedral intermediate okay and then when we create our tetrahedral intermediate i'll actually draw it all i'm not going to do the whole reaction mechanism for all these for the sake of time but let's just sort of go through um one two boom Uh, what do we have? So this is one, two, three carbons. One, two, three carbons. Right? And then when we get the tetrahedral intermediate, we always ask ourselves. Good leaving group. Good leaving group. So this comes down and, well, so first of all, I hope everybody sees that we do have a good leaving group, right? That chloride. So that will come down, kick that off. And now, um, I'm left with one, two, one, two, three. Awesome. So now I'm left with just a ketone. But of course, ketones will also react with Grignard. So now we have a second round of addition. And that's how I get. Uh, Well, and I shouldn't be lazy, but that's how I'm going to then create another tetrahedral intermediate. This time there isn't a good leaving group. So all I can do is protonate it and make it this tertiary alcohol. All right. And then what happens with a Gilman and an acyl halide? I wanted to stack these two examples next to each other so we can remember that they do slightly different things. You get a ketone? You get a ketone. All right, so this effectively stops at like this step here, right? Remember, our Gilmans are not as good as our Grignards. Gilmans will react with acyl halides, but they won't react with ketones or aldehydes. So once you form that ketone, you kick off that good leaving group, you're stuck there. All right, so I, I like to do these examples, stack them next to each other, because of course we have these organometallics filed away in the same place in our brain, but this is a great example of how the Gilmans just aren't quite as good of nucleophiles as the Grignards. Okay. So crash course in organometallics. Next, we got What do you think of when you see 
Well, so first of all, what do I mean by this H fancy V? Light. Light, right? So what do you think when you're seeing something like this? What type of reaction? Uh, radical. Yeah, so these are our radicals, right? So these light catalyzed reactions were all about creating radicals. Um, so let's just do a few examples here. All right, crap. Well, this is all the way back in the pre-corona days here when we were actually able to be in the classroom when we, we did these radical type reactions. It seems like so long ago. Um, so first of all, let's talk about the difference, the biggest difference between the chlorine and the bromine in these reactions. Does anybody remember what that is? I think the chlorine um, adds twice, but the bromine only adds once. Is it? No, that's not it. So the, to, to so this is a, it's a good question or a good, uh, a good problem. It's hard to control the extent of these reactions. So that's when you have to really play with conditions. Like you would, you couldn't have like a large excess of chlorine. Um, yeah, that's kind of beyond the scope of this course as to how do you prevent adding one or a dichloro or a trichloro, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to really be with how you design it. There was something that was even a little bit more fundamentally different about the chlorines and the bromines. And this has like more selective about where it adds it's like those numbers awesome awesome yeah so and the key word that you just said is that word selective okay so chlorine and and let's not worry about quantifying we did do that and you guys can look back in your notes we actually figured out how to actually like numerically get our distribution of products but the bottom line is in the chlorine you will have much uh more equitable of a mixture of the two possible products Whereas bromine is incredibly selective and will only add to that more highly substituted carbon. One grand exception to this is going to be like in the following example. Anybody know what happens here? Which one of these carbons, let's take a vote here. One, two, or three. Which one of these carbons do we think is gonna be the uh, major product the, uh, substituted for? Carbon two. one. So the, you would be very tempted to say two because it's the most highly substituted. But Sam's absolutely right, it is carbon one. Why carbon one, Sam? Um, doesn't it? Since it's the acyl, not acyl, aryl carbon, uh, uh, It's actually the benzylic, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's not get all bowed down on that. The bottom line is in these, all these steps, right? The reason why um, it's this carbon is more highly substituted is because the more highly substituted carbon has the more stable radical, right? When you have a benzene ring in there, by far the most stable radical, if, even if there's a tertiary, is going to be that benzylic carbon. So any radical reactions that happen with a benzene ring involved is going to be substituted on what's called the benzylic carbon or the one that's one removed from the ring, right? This guy right here is like the most stable radical that you're gonna be able to get. So yeah, so in the case here, even though I did this example just to trip you up, it would not go on that more highly substituted carbon. It's gonna go on that benzylic carbon. All right, and then again, let's stack uh, three similar reactions on top of each other. Let's 
see if you guys, I'm going to give you guys like a minute, see if you guys can't tell me what happens here. I, I will say this is not a radical reaction, this first one here. I just want to make sure that we all know the difference between these. All right, so let's go, let's actually name these guys real quick. What's the name of our first product? Uh, one butene. Uh, the, yeah, that's the, that's the reactant, right? So this is just- one. Oh, so you rock one of the product, my bad. No, you're good. What's my product's name? Uh, two bromo butane. Two bromo butane, right? So uh, just keep it same. All right, so here we got two bromo because with HBr we have substitution of and that more high or it's actually addition. We have addition where the bromine goes on that more highly substituted carbon, right? This is through the carbocation carbocation intermediate. This is like what we reviewed uh, last class, right? The first step is going to be the addition of a proton. That's going to stick a carbocation on that more highly substituted carbon, which is then going to go and grab that bromide ion. Or I guess the bromide ion is going to grab the carbocation, but yeah. All right, so yeah, so this is uh, HBr all by itself. What about when we have it in the presence of peroxide? 1,2-dibromobutane? It's not 1,2-dibromobutane. So that would be... Huh, huh. If we had Br2 without any sort of light or any sort of a radical reaction, that's when we get our anti-addition of bromine to our double bond. Here we only get the one bromo product, but what's the shtick with peroxide? Does anybody remember? Uh, they encourage the anti-mark addition. Yes, absolutely. So this is how you get substitution on the less highly substituted carbon, right? So now we get the one bromo. All right, and remember peroxide is very much so playing a similar role to what light is. In fact, up here, I could have catalyzed these reactions with peroxide as well. That's just our radical generator. And then NBS, I told, I hopefully hammered something into your head about NBS. What should you be thinking when you see NBS? Allylic carbon. Boom, nice, Natasha, allylic carbon, absolutely. So here you have addition on the allylic carbon and your double bond is preserved, right? So NBS is like this special bromine type radical that will add to the allylic carbon and won't actually disturb your double bond. So now we have uh, actually, three bromo one butene. My handwriting is great at the bottom of the page there. Uh, for the for the um, the one that you added, uh, let's, let me see if I can find it. Oh, with the molecular bromide without any kind of peroxide that yeah. would be like it would be coming towards us and away from us right just as far as stereochemistry goes yes except for eric uh the fact that this is not an asymmetric center 
So there's actually no weird stereo chemistry that you have to worry about. If that was an asymmetric center, you're exactly right. We would only get two of our four possible stereo isomers. Uh, but that isn't a, just in this example, doesn't happen to be a stereo center. But yes, uh, I guess this would be an anti addition. All right, so that BR2 gets added. One bromine gets added to one side of the double bond. The other bromine gets added to the other side of the double bond. All right, and then last thing about uh, these radical reactions that were kind of important, they all have the same three steps involved in them. What is that first step? Initiation. Yeah, so we have initiation. And that would look something like, remember with these radicals, you always have these double arrows. What do we call this kind of cleavage of that bond? Homeolytic breakage. Yeah. So this is homolytic. Uh, what's the next step? Propagation. 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 And then what's the last step? Termination. <laughs> Jump in the gun. Termination and termination occurs when? Two radicals. Two radicals find one another, right? And then they just kind of plug each other up and they no longer react. So it's sort of the exact opposite. We then have our two coming together to form a new bond, right? Um, I want to keep the ball rolling here. So propagation uh, is something I would make a, put a little star, make sure to go back and review what that looks like uh, from a reaction mechanism standpoint. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're good with radicals here. So let's jump ahead. Okay, so the next topic that we covered were carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, so let's just make sure that we even remember what the heck they all are. Everybody take a second to name all of these compounds. Is that it? Am I forgetting one? All right, forgetting one. All right, actually this ketone, we, well, we can go ahead and name it, but it's not really in the carboxylic acid 
derivative group, nonetheless, still behaves pretty similarly. Um, so what do we, so first of all, these are all uh, one, two, three, four carbons, but really the endings are what I want to practice here. What do we, uh, how do we name our acyl chlorides? What ending do we use? Oil. Oil, absolutely, right? So this is butanoyl chloride, all right? So the oil ending. Uh, what about this? What is this? Amide. An amide. So this is? Butanamide. Butanamide. Awesome. Um, and then this is, of course, carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid. So how do we name our carboxylic acids? Butanoic acid. Yeah. Oic. Acid. Um, and then this guy, what do we call that little functional group there? Ester. So, and how do we name our esters? O8. Yeah. The only thing about the ester that you also have to remember is you got to include what's going on over here, right? So this is methyl butano Right, where that prefix is telling you what's happening on the other side of your ester functional group. All right, and lastly, a ketone here. Again, this doesn't quite fit in this category, but since I drew it, we'll just name it real quick. Yeah. So now we have to indicate the position of that oxo group. So this would be two pentanone. All right, and take a second and rank these. Uh, we'll get rid of this one now. Rank these four in terms of their reactivity. What's the most reactive? What's the least reactive? What's in the middle? What's our most reactive carboxylic der acid derivative? Uh, um, acyl chloride. Yeah, so this guy here is the most reactive. What's the least reactive? The amide. Yeah. And then these guys are kind of tied for second. Okay. So if you remember, this chapter was basically all about converting one of these carboxylic acid derivatives into another one of these carboxylic acid derivatives, right? Converting acyl chlorides to amides or uh, carboxylic acids to esters, blah, 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 blah. That was like the meat of this chapter. So let's just make sure we remember how to do that. So I'll make one of our little wheels here. Probably could have been spaced a little bit better, but whatever.
that's another few seconds to finish it up here. All right, so let's start with sort of this inside ring here, because I think that this is the easiest. How do we get from an acyl chloride to a carboxylic acid? Uh, water and an acid? Yeah, I mean, you only need water, right? So the acyl chlorides are the most reactive. You really can just... Uh, you know, uncatalyzed, be able to go from one to the other, or from an acyl chloride to any of these other things, right? So absolutely, water is the key there, right? That's what I need to react with my carbo uh, with my electrophilic carbonyl carbon to get that OH group. What about an ester? In methanol. Yeah. So an alcohol in this particular case, methanol will take us there. And then if we want to go to the amide. Ammonia. Yeah. All right. If it had instead, if I had wanted this to be like a secondary amide, well, let's just do that. Then it would be. Oops. I need to keep these color coded. But yes, an amine will give you an amide, water, carboxylic acid, and uh, alcohol will give you an ester, right? And so if you're starting with an acyl chloride, since that's the most reactive, you really don't have to worry about having those catalysts in order to drive that reaction forward. Um, what about... If I want to get from a carboxylic acid to an amide, what would I need there? Amine? Yeah, an amine, right? So I'm just gonna need to use that same amine. However, amine. because I'm starting with a carboxylic acid, you do need a little bit of heat in order to drive that reaction. Uh, you guys are not wrong for sort of thinking acid catalysts here, but remember if you're using an amine, all an acid is going to do is protonate that amine and make it a crappy nucleophile. <clears throat> so that's why heat is the only way that we can sort of drive these reactions. Um, same thing over here, right? If I want to get from my ester to a, an amide, it's the exact same thing. Right, esters and carboxylic acids are about as reactive, so you're still going to need to use uh, an acid catalyst in order to get there. Okay. Uh, what about going from an ester to a carboxylic acid? You need water and an acid. Water and an acid. All right, so here, if I'm going to go from an ester to a carboxylic acid, you need water and an acid. Is there another way I can do it? Probably. Alcohol, maybe? No, an alcohol, so an alcohol will take you this way, right? An alcohol is a good way to make an ester, not to make the carboxylic acid. But we can do the exact same thing. So this would be uh, option A. with a base as well, right? Hydroxide is a good nucleophile. So if we had a basic solution, this guy is just gonna come and eventually kick off that good leaving group, the ester. So this you can do in basic solutions or acidic solutions, but you do need that catalyst. What if I wanna go the other way? I wanna go from a carboxylic acid back 
to the. Uh, you'd have to use uh, an alcohol under acidic or basic conditions. So definitely the alcohol, most important thing, right? So I hope that this is something that's been hammered into your brain. You just toss in uh, an amine, you're going to get an amine. Water, you're going to get a carboxylic acid. Alcohol, you're going to get an ester, right? That's kind of the most important ingredients here. The details of the catalyst, yeah, that's important to know. But if you don't have that first, you're, you're screwed. Okay. Now, I'll tell you, there's only one way to do this. There isn't the same two ways. Only one of these two conditions will work. Does anybody, can anybody guess what that would be? Acidic or basic? Acidic. Yeah, Tony, why acidic? Because uh, the base would depronate the carboxylic. Boom, right? If, you have a, if you're starting with a carboxylic acid and you add a base, you're going to make a carboxylate ion. A carboxylate ion is not a good electrophile. Right, so this can only occur under acidic conditions to get back. Um, uh, and then lastly, let's do how do we get, can anybody tell me how to get to an acyl chloride? CO. What is it? HCO. HCL? PCL. Yeah. Uh, wait. So the PCL3, I think you're saying? PCL3. Yeah. Right. So here, you got to start with your carboxylic acid. Right. But remember, PCL3 is a way that we learned about how we can chlorinate a hydroxide, uh, how we get, can chlorinate an alcohol, replace an alcohol with a chlorine. Works the same with the carboxylic acids. But this is really the only way that we know how to make are acyl chlorides, starting with a carboxylic acid and then adding PCL3, phosphorus trichloride. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so this is a good, good sort of summary of um, chapter 15. Uh, remember, this is where, actually, let's just do it here. Uh, everybody, let's take a second and give me the reaction mechanism here. Um, what is my nucleophile? The alcohol. This guy here? It's not an alcohol though, right? What do we call that? Hydroxide. Hydroxide, yep. And so my, nu my electrophile is? The electrophilic. 
Electrophilic, carbonyl carbon. And then carbon can't have more than five, uh, four bonds, so that pair of electrons comes up. So this is where we were first introduced. The whole reason I wanted to do this is because this is where we were first introduced to this tetrahedral intermediate. We later see it like over and over and over again when we were dealing with aldehydes and ketones. But again, this is any time your carbonyl carbon is acting as an electrophile, you will get your tetrahedral intermediate. Okay, now from here, since we do have a good leaving group, this pair of electrons will come down and kick off this guy here. And that's how we get our carboxylic acid, which because we're in basic conditions will quickly get deprotonated and really form your carboxylate. That's what makes these reactions irreversible in basic conditions. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, all right, so anyways, Hopefully you got that tetrahedral intermediate and then had that leaving group get kicked off, right? That's the important part of these reaction mechanisms. Okay. Um, so now let's move on to, uh, what do we call these? Aldehydes. Aldehydes. So I want you guys to take a second and see, you know, give me five things that you can tell me about this compound right here. Does it have any electrophilic sites, any nucleophilic sites? Uh, yeah, right. There's kind of a lot of information just in these molecules that we learned about here. So take a second and see if you can't detail a list of just five different features of this molecule. What's its name, et cetera. All right, so first of all, it's butanol. Butanol. I guess you got a really freaking like southern person pronounce that ending so it doesn't sound like an alcohol. Butanol. Um, I think you're saying it wrong. What, uh, oh, yeah, so correct me. I don't know how to pronounce it either, though. <laughs> all right. Does it have any electrophilic sites? The carbonyl carbon. Yeah, right, so electrophile. So basically what I'm trying to sort of hammer home here is we learned quite a bit about these aldehydes and ketones. They've got some special features to them, right? So first of all, they always have this electrophilic site. That's that carbonyl carbon. They've also got a nucleophilic site. Where is that? The alpha carbon. Yeah, so we've seen that This carbon here can play the role of a nucleophile specifically because that alpha hydrogen is relatively acidic. 
right? The other site that can play a role of a nucleophile much, much more seldom is this oxygen. And that is only with regard to um, reacting with strong acid. Actually, let's just say can be protonated. All right, so this oxygen here, if we have these under strongly acidic conditions, this guy here can be protonated. I don't know what the fifth one is. I didn't really count a certain number, but bottom line is when you look at these types of compounds, you wanna remember all these various features. We have an electrophilic site. We also have a nucleophilic site. We have a relatively acidic hydrogen and we have an oxygen that's willing to accept a proton in strong acid. Okay. Um, so then let's, uh, let's just do, what was our simplest reaction that we had with these guys? It's like a halogenation now. Oh, that would have been at the alpha carbon. Okay, that's right. Um, yeah, so I guess we actually broke these up into, I forgot about this. This is broken up into two chapters. Chapter 16 is all about that electrophilic site, right? All about that alpha, uh, all about that carbonyl carbon playing the role of an electrophile. Um, what are some good... Let's say that I'm going to start with this guy here. Give me three different nucleophilic substitution reactions that we can have. Or no, not substitution, huh? Nucleophilic addition reactions that we can have here. What are three nucleophiles that would react with this ketone? Greenard. Yeah, Grenard would be one. All right, so we can really have our choice. That would be a great way to create. Let me make this smaller. I went, I went real big right off the bat here. What's another one? So first of all, Grignard, I would get what product? In this case, I would get, well, I would definitely get a tertiary alcohol in the case of my two carbon Grignard. It looks something like that. What would be another one? LAH. Li this, uh, yeah, H four. So your hydrides, right? Remember, your hydrides are also good nucleophiles. And when you think hydride, you're thinking what is playing the role of the nucleophile? The hydrogen. The hydrogen specifically, right? So if I'm gonna, I'll even do this reaction mechanism just so we can sort of see what's going on here. This is where this hydrogen is going to come and attack that carbonyl carbon, right? The net effect is a reduction of this, but again, key to remember, you have this hydrogen playing the role of the nucleophile. So this would give me my secondary alcohol. Anything else? Cyanide ion. What is it? Cyanide ion. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So here, and. You even sometimes just see this as HCN. That would be also that protonation step that you would need at the end there. But yes, absolutely. The cyanide ion can also come and react with that uh, electrophilic carbonyl carbon, giving us our nitrile group.
And there was one more, but I'll give it to you because we really didn't talk too, too much about it. Um, and that is your acetylide ion, right? So C triple bonded uh, can form a really good nucleophile as well. All right, and just like in what would have been the previous chapter of carboxylic acid derivatives, these all go through that same tetrahedral intermediate. The difference is, is if you're going to start with an aldehyde or ketone, there is no good leaving group. So you only really have that protonation option to work with. Okay. Um... I mean, there was some new, oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, and then let's do also what happens if we were to take our ketone and put in a primary amine. You get an amine? Yep. So draw one of those for me. Make sure you know what the heck that is. Oh, and this has to be also in trace acid. All right, and then tell me how we would get an enamine as well. Somebody give me a reactive for that. It'd be a secondary amine, right? Yeah, absolutely. Secondary amine, and really any secondary amine would work. However, they do absolutely love to use this guy. They must know something that we don't in terms of a practical uh, usage for that. But you, you see this in particular a lot. But yeah, this would form an enamine. Which I didn't give myself enough room to draw. Okay. And an enamine is just an amine right next to a double bond. Um, we actually know, make this even more complicated. See if you can't think of anything that you know how to do with an enamine. Well, you can react it with like an acyl chloride. To uh, yeah. So, something. yeah, this is um, very similar. You know, the bottom line here is when you see these enamines, you want to think. about how this guy right here can be a nucleophile. Uh, 
Um, so basically, yeah, I mean, any electrophile or any sort of good electrophile is going to do it for you. You're absolutely right. You can isolate it. Or you could alkylate it by having an alkyl halide, right? But the bottom line is that carbon is a nucleophile. So if we have something where now these carbons here are good electrophiles, those will react with our enamines. Um, we actually, yeah, so let's, well, well, we'll see this similar. This is similar to when you use like LDA and uh, a ketone is going to be the same as using the enamine. So let's, let's now go over that, right? So the, first of all, I kind of got a little bit off track here. All these are examples of your electrophilic carbonyl carbon. Okay, and now, I, so that was one important feature of our ketones aldehydes, that electrophilic carbonyl carbon. The other one is that relatively acidic alpha hydrogen. So let's practice some with that. Come on. Um. Yeah, so the first, I think, oh, oh gosh, yeah, okay. Before we go on, dive into this real quick, there is one sort of overarching thing about reaction mechanisms that is really important to remember, right? So let's just talk reaction mechanisms. Under acidic conditions, If I'm drawing a reaction mechanism under acidic conditions, I should never see what? A negative charge? Yes. No negative charges. All right, just something that's very important to keep in mind when you're doing any sort of reaction mechanism at all. If you're doing these under acidic conditions, there will be no negative charges. And under basic conditions, I will say that like the exceptions being a bromide ion or a chloride ion or something like that, just these terribly, terribly weak bases, uh, those you do see come off even in acidic conditions. Um, but generally speaking, you should never have like an oxygen with a negative charge, right? That's just never gonna happen under acidic conditions. Likewise, under basic conditions, no, positive charges. All right, so that's just a good rule of thumb. You can tell that you're going down the wrong path if you do have that, all right? So um, one of the first things that we learned about uh, reaction-wise with our acidic, uh, I'm sorry, with our, yeah, acidic alpha hydrogen is where all right under acidic conditions um we can have chlorination reactions or halogenation reactions um and here let's actually just make it an aldehyde so we don't have multiple products to worry about here. Uh, everybody take a second and give me what I'm gonna get under acidic conditions versus basic conditions.
Uh, what's the big difference between these two? No clue? All right, so both of these reactions will halogenate your alpha carbon, All right? The difference is, is under acidic conditions, you will have exactly one halogenation event where under basic conditions, all alpha hydrogens will be replaced. Okay, and the key intermediate under acidic conditions is what do we call that guy? An enol. Yeah, the enol. Remember, like our enol is just like we were talking with our enamines. When you see an enol, you're thinking, ah, this carbon right here is a nucleophile. Okay, but notice that it has to be the neutral enol intermediate because this is acidic conditions compared to if we had under basic conditions, this would be that enolate ion. The, the fact that this carbon is playing the role of a nucleophile is the same. But remember, under basic conditions, I'm allowed to have this negative charge. Under acidic conditions, that oxygen has to be protonated. All right, so if you need to review the reaction mechanisms for these two, I would. But um, yeah, the bottom line is they go through these two different intermediates. First step in this one is going to be protonation of that carbonyl oxygen, right? That's the first step under acidic conditions. Okay. All right, and then um, I guess kind of out of time, but just uh, sort of remind back to where I was going in the first place. If we wanted to alkylate that alpha carbon, we actually have two different ways to do it. See if you guys can't think of what those, at least one of those two different ways would be. Well, I know one, you could use LDA to remove the... Yeah, boom, right? So importantly, let's just all remember what the heck is LDA? Uh, Dilithium, lithium diisopropyl amide. Yeah, don't, like, that. like that's awesome. But beyond that, what do you, you see LDA and you think? Good base. Alpha. Good base. Hey. Right, and so LDA is just a super strong base so what that can do is deprotonate that alpha carbon, right? Leave us with this carbon. This is actually what we would call this enolate ion. Uh, nonetheless, bottom line is you have a now a nuclear, pretty obvious that you have that nucleophilic carbon. So then if we take this and we add an alkyl halide, because remember when you see alkyl halide, you're looking at this carbon and thinking electrophile then that will get us this way. We can accomplish the same thing, remember, but because LDA is such a strong base, that kind of makes it a pain in the butt to work with. So the other way to do this would be to uh, first create your enamine intermediate. and then react this with an alkyl halide. Both of those will get you to the same path there. Oh, you gotta then follow it up with 
some acid to chop off the nitrogen. All right, but those are the two, we had like two different paths of being able to alkylate. One of them is using LDA. One of them is using the enamine. This is the more like conceptually friendly one. This is the more in the lab practical one. All right, so that's why we got to learn too. Okay, so that's, that's all, I, all the time I got. Um, do you guys have any questions? about the stuff that we covered today? Um, ketones and aldehydes don't react with tertiary amines, right? No, they do not react to tertiary amines. There's gotta be a hydrogen that can be dis displaced. Yeah, good question. Cool. All right. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so do me a big favor and put in some studying time over the weekend, identify your weak points and come to me on Tuesday with some questions so we can uh, do some practice problems that are targeted at what you guys don't quite understand. Um, we didn't get to what would the last exam three was on yet. So right, we haven't yet covered our benzenes acting as nucleophiles, our aromatic substitution reactions. Uh, so we'll do a little bit of that next time and then anything else miscellaneous that I could think of that we need to have set again before uh, final exam on Thursday. Exactly one week at this time, you will be done with your organic chemistry journey, right? So woo. you guys have been whittled down to uh, the select few here. So just stay strong for this last push and then it'll be summer break where we will continue to be stuck inside all the time. Awesome. All right, uh, Eric, if you want to hang around, give me like two seconds to fill up my water bottle and then we can go over these linkages. Cool. All right, everybody else, uh, if you want to stay, awesome. If not, have a good weekend. Anna, are you going to be going to lecture for the uh, um, for the other class? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk to Professor Yates about a few things. He wants my resume for internships over the summer, so I want to talk to him about what I need to update for it for Chem Twenty because he has like specific words he wanted for eighteen. So I figure might as well ask. Yeah, for sure. How are you doing on internships during the summer? Because he specifically said Apple wasn't taking any, and you're with Apple, right? Yeah, and um, I was thinking, I'm just, uh, it looks like the state's slowly.